Let us try to think the unthinkable. Let us try to imagine a man of a sort willing to invent the fly. That is to say, a man destitute of feeling, a man willing to wantonly torture and harass and persecute myriads of creatures who had never done him any harm and could not if they wanted to, and the majority of them, poor dumb things, not even aware of his existence. In a word, let us try to imagine a man with so singular and so lumbering a code of morals as this, that it is fair and right to send afflictions upon the just, upon the unoffending as well as upon the offending, without discrimination. If we can imagine such a man, that is the man that could invent the fly, and send him out on his mission and furnish him his orders, depart into the uttermost corners of the earth and diligently do your appointed work. Persecute the sick child, settle upon its eyes, its face, its hands, and gnaw and pester and sting, worry and fret, and madden the worn and tired mother who watches by the child, and who humbly prays for mercy and relief with the pathetic faith of the deceived and the unteachable. Settle upon the soldier's festering wounds in field and hospital, and drive him frantic, while he also prays, and between times curses, with none to listen but you, fly, who get all the petting and all the protection without even praying for it. Harry and persecute the forlorn and forsaken wretch who is perishing of the plague, and in his terror and despair praying, bite, sting, feed upon his ulcers, dabble your feet in his rotten blood, gum them thick with plague germs. Feet cunningly designed and perfected for dysfunction ages ago in the beginning. Carry this freight to a hundred tables, among the just and the unjust, the high and the low, and walk over the food and guam it with filth and death. Visit all, allow no man peace till he get in the grave. Visit and afflict the hard-worked and unoffending horse, mule, ox, ass, pester the patient cow, and all the kindly animals that labor without fair reward here, and perish without hope of it hereafter. Spare no creature, wild or tame. But wheresoever you find one, make his life a misery. Treat him as the innocent deserve, and so please me, and increase my glory, who made the fly. We hear much about his patience and forbearance and long-suffering. We hear nothing about our own, which much exceeds it. We hear much about his mercy and kindness and goodness, in words, the words of his book, and of his pulpit. And the meek multitude is content with this evidence, such as it is, seeking no further. But whoso searcheth after a concrete example of it will in time acquire fatigue, there being no instances of it. For what are gilded as mercies are not, in any recorded case, more than mere common justices, and due do without thanks or compliment. To rescue without personal risk a cripple from a burning house is not a mercy, it is a mere commonplace duty. Anybody would do it that could, and not by proxy either, delegating the work but confiscating the credit for it. If men neglected God's poor and God's stricken and helpless ones, as he does, what would become of them? The answer is to be found in those dark lands where man follows his example and turns his indifferent back upon them. They get no help at all. They cry and plead and pray in vain. They linger and suffer and miserably die. If you will look at the matter rationally and without prejudice, the proper place to hunt for the facts of his mercy is not where man does the mercies and he collects the praise, but in those regions where he has the field to himself. It is plain that there is one moral law for heaven, and another for the earth. The pulpit assures us that wherever we see suffering and sorrow, which we can relieve and do not do it, we sin heavily. There was never yet a case of suffering or sorrow which God could not relieve. Does he sin then? If he is the source of morals, he does. Certainly nothing can be plainer than that, you will admit. Surely the source of law cannot violate law and stand unsmirched. Surely the judge upon the bench cannot forbid crime and then revel in it himself, unreproached. Nevertheless, we have this curious spectacle. Daily, the trained parrot in the pulpit gravely delivers himself of these ironies, 
which he has acquired at second hand and adopted without examination to a trained congregation which accepts them without examination, and neither the speaker nor the hearer laughs at himself.